you've probably had a game like this. Somebody starts doing some nutty stuff, surprisingly early in the game, really going ham with their pieces of cardboard, and by the time they've achieved a decisive win a handful of turns later, one or more other players are sitting dejectedly and grumbling to themselves that this matchup was unfair. Power level differences within a table can be a tricky thing to navigate. You know, it's not fun if a game ends up being an absolute blowout, with some players feeling like they didn't even get a chance. And I generally encourage trying to coordinate power levels to some degree at your tables. But do you want to know a secret? In most cases like this, the relative power levels of the decks aren't even the main issue. Decks with varied power levels can work fine in the same pod, and games can avoid this blowout issue. But this requires a couple things to be true, and the first one of these is very simple. Decks should run interaction. I mentioned in my last video how a key table dynamic that keeps powerful decks in check in a multiplayer format is the ability for multiple other players to trade cards one for one with a player who is ahead. And I don't think I need to say much else to make clear the problem with a lot of casual EDH tables. They can't do this because they don't run enough ways to trade cards like this. A lot of decks throw in some mid-single digits number of generic removal spells and or counterspells, and then call it good spending the rest of their deck on their engines and synergies and whatnot, building up their deck's ability to function against no opponents. Then, when a pot of these decks show up to a table, before too long, a player will naturally start to get ahead, and their opponents won't have a lot of recourse for it. This amplifies power differences, because if a deck is even a little better at what it does, say, generating an extra half of a card per turn in value, there will be nothing to prevent that advantage from piling up at an interactionless table. A compounding factor for this sort of dynamic is when decks have high variance. I think the best way to quantify this is to think about the difference between the deck's 75th percentile situation, when it's playing somewhat better than average, and the deck's 25th percentile situation, when it's playing somewhat worse than average. Most well-constructed decks will have some difference between these two, but not a massive one, your 25th percentile situation won't feel great, but you'll still have plays you're setting up for and goals you're making progress toward, and maybe you're just playing a bit slower, a bit riskier, or a bit less interactive than usual. By contrast, a lot of casual EDH decks I've seen were built putting so much emphasis on the ideal scenario, the big pop-off factor, that as much as 25% or 30% or even 40% of the time, they fail to perform meaningful game actions. This comes down to one thing above all others, putting in too many payoff cards and not enough building blocks to get there. I'd categorize payoff cards into two types. One is amplification cards, cards that convert your tokens into more tokens, your counters into more counters, your damage into more damage, and your draw into more draw. Some number of these cards can be decent for a deck, especially cards that can rapidly lead to a win or which synergize with a type of card you'll have especially ample access to. However, if you run too many of these, and too few things to be amplified, your game plan will be fragile. A while back, I had a series of games with a Zaxara player who would play multiple counter doublers and mana doublers and various other doublers, followed by a single premium Hydra, maybe a second one if they got lucky. If that Hydra had survived a turn cycle, they probably would have smacked down the table in short order. But, in all the games this happened, a single removal spell was played, the Zaxara player had no counter magic, and just like that, they and their pile of synergy permanents were rendered a total non-threat. I don't want to be too hard on this player, since it seemed like their deck was pretty newly built at the time and hadn't been tested much, but this is an example of a trap that's pretty easy to fall into if you're not careful and are just adding stuff that looks good without thinking about the implications of those additions. The other main type of payoff card is what I'll call conversion cards, ones that give you one type of resource as a result of having or spending a different one. For example, spending mana to draw cards when you've gained life, drawing cards based on having a bunch of creatures of the same type, creating wolves based on how many cards are in your graveyard, and creating angels when you play enchantments. As with amplification cards, these aren't inherently bad, and are indeed a perfectly solid type of card in moderation. But Running too many of these resource conversion cards will have problematic results for deck consistency. 
if your deck's core building blocks already require you to be doing well in some capacity, you're limiting your ability to get your game plan going in the first place. Pair this with running an excessive quantity of amplification cards as well, and you'll find that your deck will struggle to get into gear consistently, will struggle to play through interaction, and will struggle to get up off the floor after it's been shut down. Sure, you'll have the crazy pop-off games from time to time where things line up just right, but the overall result of a high-variance deck like this is this sort of all-or-nothing dynamic that I find very negative, and if the whole table is playing this sort of deck, differences in deck power levels will naturally be amplified wildly. When one player gets the lucky pop-off, whereas the others get stuck with dead hands full of unmet payoff cards, and especially when nobody has interaction to close this sort of gap in performance, decks can feel poorly matched and power imbalanced even when they're the exact same power level. As a foil to these sorts of decks, I'm going to dig back into my past for a moment and talk about a couple decks I built a few years ago. From 2019 to 2022, my playgroup, mostly made up of broke college students at that point, played exclusively with a pool of 10 $30 EDH decks, and we agonizingly tuned and pruned and fully rebuilt these decks when needed until each of these decks played to a power we were satisfied with. The end result of this process was a pool of decks that are not like most casual EDH decks. These decks have been brought to life in a setting that is almost competitive in nature where there is a meta to keep up with and adapt to, where each deck is played dozens of times over with every single win and loss tracked, and where decks that don't make the cut, that don't win a lot of games, get scrapped without further question. In this environment, decks are built with a high degree of consistency and a lot of interaction because these factors lead decks to win more games in this sort of faux competitive environment. This fact, paired with the low budget, resulted in a format where resiliency and ability to grind were the most important factors for a deck. The funny thing is, despite these decks being built on a low budget and designed to play exclusively against each other, most of these decks still hold up in games with decks that are much more powerful on paper, and a big piece of this is because of their relationship with interaction. Take a Demir Rogues list I built. It runs 6 counter spells, 6 removal spells, 2 modal cards that can counter or remove, and 3 stacks cards. In addition, the proactive cards in the deck don't rely on it being ahead or avoiding opposing interaction. Even something like Bident of Thassa generates acceptable amounts of value with a single evasive creature, of which the deck is running 25. These factors work together to make a deck that is very flexible and which can perform actions like hindering its opponents, chipping in damage, and drawing extra cards, even when it's behind. Not only this, but the high watermark of the deck is genuinely pretty high, with 30 plus damage combat steps, massive draw, extra turns, and forcing opponents to discard their hands, all options on the table for the deck, and these plays are important for allowing the deck to get to the finish line once it's ahead. A Rakdos discard deck from the same pool is similarly heavy on interaction. It's running 10 cards plus the commander for removal, as well as 25 cards that cause opponents to discard cards. The deck's cards also work well on their own, as a matter of necessity. When a deck's game plan involves forcing the table into a hellbent state, it's not going to play a bunch of stuff that requires lots of setup, because that's the exact sort of deck it's looking to disorient and hinder through discard spells. Both of these decks are consistent, grindy, and interaction-dense, leading them to fit in quite well at a variety of different tables, and always feel like they're contributing something to the game even when other decks have significantly stronger cards. When I reflect on games with these old decks, there's something almost paradoxical at play. These highly optimized decks, decks that are overwhelmingly dedicated to nuts and bolts functionality over all else, led to gameplay that was way more fun to me than a lot of games I've played with more conventional EDH decks that have wacky card choices and perform lots of big, splashy plays. Playing decks that are packed with interaction and also resilient to setbacks leads to fewer feel-bad, I'm-doing-nothing type moments, and way more moments where it feels like you're actually playing a multiplayer game where different players are trying to navigate their way to a win while also keeping their opponents in check. And this is certainly not to say that playing with a pool of hyper-optimized $30 decks is the only way to achieve this. There are plenty of things that people find fun about EDH that won't be found in an environment like this, and there's a reason my playgroup doesn't play exclusively with these decks anymore. <laughs>
However, I think it's worthwhile to consider these sorts of decks as an example of how EDH can be played. We can think about EDH decks along a spectrum, with the most interactionless, high variance decks out there on one end of things, and then decks like these, which prioritize consistency, resiliency, and interactiveness above all else, on the opposite end. If you're finding your games too frequently feeling like a roll of the dice, where some person happens onto an insane opening and then runs away with the game, just know that swinginess is a malleable feature. You can move along this spectrum of gameplay, and reducing the swinginess of your games can be as simple as following the two deck building tips I've been mentioning in this video, running more in interaction, and improving a deck's consistency and resiliency by removing payoff cards that are unnecessary or difficult to fulfill. Doing these things will generally reduce the frustrating feeling of playing a deck that feels like it's doing nothing, and a table with relatively consistent interactive decks will feel much more dynamic and balanced, regardless of how powerful each of those decks actually are. 